Welcome to BlackSap. Welcome to today's science talks. Welcome to Michael Paulin, who is with us uh, virtually. And a huge welcome back to everyone, as this is our first science talk after the summer holidays as part of our series on the regenerative. Today's talk is on biomimicry and regenerative design. And I'm extremely honored to welcome Michael Paulin, architect, researcher, practitioner, and possibilist. With extensive research and experience in architecture and the regenerative, I've been looking so much forward to today. Michael has just recently published with Sarah Ichika, and I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, Michael, the book Flourish. I can highly recommend it. Some of you may already have read it, but it certainly becomes quite paramount and evident just how our, the regenerative is a necessity in the design paradigms for our planetary emergencies. So I hope that you're all excited and looking as much forward to today's talk as I am. We have people with us physically and a huge welcome to you. It is so nice to see you. And a huge welcome to all of you who are with us virtually. It is also really nice to have you with us. I know that some of you are uh, quite far away from us, located in Copenhagen, as Bloxup is. And you will be more than welcome to post comments and questions in the chat. I have wonderful colleagues assisting me today in reading and encouraging you to list your comments. As I have mentioned before, when I welcome to science talks, in the regenerative uh, paradigm, it's essential that you contribute positively. It's not about minimizing the damage or repairing damages. You have to create added value through your approach. But what is it? So in some of the conversations I've had with Michael before today, I have been asking Michael to help us in explicating what is the regenerative actually about to highlight an emphasis, what is the tr transition that we are embarking on in order to live within the planetary boundaries. So this is what we'll be focusing on today, amongst other things. For those of you who've not been to BlockSub and do not know about us, just a little bit about ourselves. We were founded in 2018 as an initiative to create a space where collaboration and partnerships between companies, organizations, researchers, and practitioners can emerge, develop, and thrive. We are about 700 research organizations uh, and companies, interest organizations who share our lives in BlockSub, either as residents or members. We try to ensure new, the emergence of new partnerships, new research projects, forming networks, and also, ultimately, to ensure what we will also focus on today and how we can accelerate and ensure the green transition in more ways than just one. We believe the new solutions to sustainable urban development come from consilience and collaborations. So as we proceed, I can only encourage you to comment, pose your questions. We will have times for questions later with Michael, so note away as Michael will uh, continue with his presentation. Michael, thank you so much for being with us. I have enjoyed our talks. It's now time for the rest of our wonderful people with us here today to uh, hear you uh, engage and share your experiences and thoughts with us. So without further ado, we'll reconvene with me on stage after your, your talk. Thank you and welcome again. Great. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Penilla, and thanks so much for involving me. So, as uh, Penilla said, I'm going to be talking about the regenerative paradigm and particularly how important I think biomimicry is going to be in that. And I'll explain exactly what I mean by biomimicry and I'll show some project examples where I've used that. But before we start, I just want to establish a bit of a sort of context of, of deep time. So it's sometimes said that the photograph taken of planet Earth from the moon, the so-called Earthrise photograph, was what launched the environmental movement. In many ways, I find this photograph more interesting. 
This was taken by the Cassini spacecraft. As it was passing Jupiter, it turned around and it took this photograph of planet Earth. And you can see that we are just this tiny blue dot isolated in space and no one is coming to our rescue. It's entirely up to us. And this also makes me think of ideas of deep time. And to, to get a, an understanding of deep time, I think it's useful to um, just imagine for a moment that Earth's history, if it were represented as a single calendar year, and you were standing a breath before midnight on New Year's Eve, and you were looking back over that year, well, what you would find is that not much happened during the, the first few months. The first life forms appeared in March. The dinosaurs came in mid-December and disappeared on Boxing Day. The first humans appeared around 8 p.m. today, the 31st of December. The whole of recorded history has flashed past in the last 30 seconds. In the last two seconds, humans became a geophysical force altering our climate. In the last third of a second, that's the time I've been alive, we've extinguished two thirds of the, the wildlife on planet Earth. And it would be easy to conclude that we are racing towards extinction. But in that last third of a second, we've also mastered solar energy. We've developed phenomenal scientific knowledge and unparalleled technology. And what we do in the next tenth of a second will determine to a large extent the future of humanity. Now, for me, this moment in time was, was a turning point. I had been working on transformative projects for quite some time. I set up my company in 2007. So I'd been doing about 11 years worth of projects, um, largely within uh, what would be described as sustainability. But this uh, report from the IPCC really made it clear how far off track we were. I'd been following the, the climate debate for a long time. So, it, I mean, it wasn't as if it was a complete surprise, but what, what did worry me was this showed that 30 years of sustainable design had not got us anywhere near to where we need to be. And cultural commentators often like to point to very specific moments in time when certain shifts happened. So for instance, some people point to this day, the 16th of July in 1945, as the day that the Anthropocene started. The Anthropocene is the geological era in which humans dominated. So this was the, the first time that an atomic weapon had been tested in the deserts of, of New Mexico. And the radioactive particles that spread around the world will be detectable for the rest of Earth's history. This is a, another really key moment, quite well known to architects. So this moment, the 16th of March in 1972, when the pruitt Igo housing blocks were demolished, this was declared by the architectural critic Charles Jenks as the day that modernism died. And in our book, the one that I wrote with Sarah Ichioka, Flourish, we argue that this moment was a similarly uh, epic moment. So the 10th of October in 2018, just a few days after the IPCC report came out, was the moment that this building, the Bloomberg headquarters in, La in London, was awarded the highest architectural prize in the United Kingdom. It's called the Sterling Prize. Now, in many ways, this is actually a good building and there's, there's lots of innovations that are interesting about it. The problem is that by the architect's own admission, if all new buildings were built this way, this would result in a three degrees C temperature rise, which is more than enough to make large areas of the tropics uninhabitable. And yet this was a building that was claimed to be the most sustainable office building ever. We have a rating system in the UK called BRIAM, and this scored the highest BRIAM rating ever. It was designed by an internationally famous architect. It had an incredibly philanthropic and wealthy client, Michael Bloomberg, and yet, it was clear that this was still nowhere near what was required. And so our conclusion in the book is that this was the day that conventional sustainability came to an end. And we urgently need to explore what the new paradigm will be that will transcend this one. And we 
my co-author and I reread one of our favorite essays. It's called Leverage Points. Uh, so this was written by Donella Meadows. She was one of the greatest th systems thinkers of all time. And what she argues in this essay is that because complex systems are difficult to, to predict, it's not always obvious where to intervene to bring about the change you want. And she lists 12 different places to intervene in a system in order of priority. And the most influential way to intervene in a complex system is by changing the mindset or paradigm that drives that system. So let's uh, just try and clarify the distinctions between the paradigm of sustainability and the paradigm of regenerative design. So this diagram comes from the architect Bill Reed, and this shows different levels of environmentally sustainable design. So the most basic level is conventional practice, which you could call one step better than breaking the law. Above that is the realm of green design or relative improvement. And this is very much the uh, uh, terrain of lead, um, rating systems like LEED and BRIAM. And then above that is fully sustainable, which the architect Bill McDonough is characterized as being 100% less bad. And the problem with this is that most of what we've been doing over the last 30 years has been somewhat less than 100% sustainable, which means that it's just part of a degenerative cycle. And somehow we need to get above that line of neutrality into the realms of having a positive impact and ultimately getting to the point where we have overcome our separation from nature and we are co-evolving as part of nature. And I'm convinced that a lot of the solutions we're going to need are to be found in biomimicry and indigenous design. So this is one of my favorite examples of indigenous technology. So this is a, a, a dwelling, well, a, a gathering space actually created in what is now Iraq in a marshland area where the only building materials they had to work with were long blades of grass. And with phenomenal ingenuity, they bundled those together into these huge bundles that were big enough to form arches. And they created a really distinctive language of architecture just from the, the available materials. And to explain biomimicry, I find this is quite a good example of, of what we can learn from nature. Uh, it's quite an entertaining one. This is an organism called a dog vomit slime mold. And Slime molds are single-celled organisms that form minimum distance networks between sources of food. And in 2009, some scientists at Hokkaido University carried out an experiment with a map of the Tokyo region. They put a little source of food, those are the white dots, on each of the cities surrounding Tokyo, and then they put a slime mold on Tokyo itself. The slime mold spread out quite quickly, it located all those sources of food, and then started optimizing the connections between them. And at the end of that, that layout exactly matched the railway network in that part of Japan. The, the key difference is that it had taken the engineers thousands of hours to arrive at that optimization, whereas the slime mold, the single-celled organism, did it in just 26 hours. And that shows just how much we could learn from the way that biology has evolved to solve certain functional challenges. In some ways, this is probably one of the oldest examples of biomimicry. So we know from architectural history that architects like Filippo Brunelleschi, who designed the, the Duomo in Florence, he looked at examples of very thin shells, seashells and bird shells, to help him design the largest and thinnest possible shell over the, the Duomo. But what we have now is the phenomenal benefits of superior scientific knowledge. So if you look at one of those shells, it's got an abalone shell. If you look at that under a powerful microscope, you find it's got this very interesting microstructure. It's made up out of these layers of calcium carbonate, which are connected together with a flexible protein mortar. And that gives it phenomenal resistance to crack propagation. At a chemical level, this is almost identical to ordinary blackboard chalk, but because of that microstructure, it achieves nearly 3,000 times the strength. 
So if we could learn more about the way that biology has evolved to make materials, there's a very good chance we could make our buildings and infrastructure using far less in the way of physical resources. So I'm going to describe regenerative design and the part that biomimicry and indigenous thinking can play in this under four main headings, starting with regenerative landscapes, then looking at regenerative cities, regenerative buildings, and regenerative materials. So starting with regenerative landscapes, this is a project that I started working on quite a long time ago now, back in 2007. So this was with a couple of colleagues. And what we were trying to do here was to use um, uh, clever integrated solutions to address multiple challenges simultaneously. And it was quite a surprise to us to learn that a lot of the world's deserts were actually vegetated a fairly short time ago. So for instance, in North Africa, uh, we know from the, the writings of Pliny that before Julius Caesar and his armies arrived, that was actually a, a, a wooded landscape of cedar trees and cypress trees. So the Romans cut a lot of those forests down to create an intensive farm, which supplied the Roman Empire with grain. But about 150 years later, they had substantially trashed that landscape. They had changed the rainfall, they denuded it of a lot of its abundance, and started the extractive model of land use that has prevailed until the present day. So the deserts, many of the, the world's deserts are actually the result of human interaction. But at the same time, they represent an amazing opportunity. If you think about the, the phenomenal amounts of energy that fall on the world's deserts, in fact, we receive about 6,000 times as much energy from the sun every year as we currently use in energy from all forms. And I'm not suggesting that transition to a fully solar economy is going to be easy, but that statistic of 6,000 to 1 does at least suggest that it is possible. It's a challenge to our ingenuity. So on this project, it's called the Sahara Forest Project, we were trying to uh, address um, problems of desertification, water shortages, food shortages, and um, energy, clean energy, in some of the, the most arid parts of the world. And we proposed this scheme that brought together a number of technologies in synergistic ways. And the core technologies were a type of greenhouse that's cooled and humidified with seawater, and it produces a certain amount of fresh water in a process inspired by a, a desert beetle. The second technology was forms of solar energy, concentrated solar power, and photovoltaics. And the third was forms of desert revegetation. And it turns out that when you bring these three technologies together, they're actually much more productive than they are by themselves. And one of the most interesting synergies is the, uh, the shade created by those mirrors or solar panels makes it possible to grow a whole range of crops underneath that would not normally grow in deserts, simply because of the intensity of the sunlight. So we managed to build a, a version of this, a prototype version. This was tested in 2012 in Qatar, and this is the project under construction. So this incorporated all the main elements and actually quite a few other technologies that we are bringing into the synergistic cluster. There's the seawater cooled greenhouse in the middle, there's forms of solar energy, there's desert revegetation, there's salt processing, there's algae for biofuels, and um, we were growing crops in, um, in, in controlled experiments um, outside. And uh, it was opened by the Emir of Qatar during the climate change talks in Doha. And this worked extremely well. We managed to grow crops throughout the summer months with half the amount of fresh water of conventional approaches. And alongside the technological optimization, we wanted to establish what this was doing in regenerative terms. And uh, we had a hunch that this was going to be having a, a, a pretty profound effect. And we had done a, an ecological survey at the start. There was basically nothing there. It was just a, a bare patch of desert. And this little infographic shows roughly what we achieved. So we made a note of any birds, mammals, and insects that appeared on the site. The first things to appear were flies. So nothing particularly interesting there. But then this literally the same day that we brought the first plants to site, we had the first birds. 
And very soon after that, we had the first insects, grasshoppers, and crickets. And a month later, we had the first butterflies. And bear in mind that this was a long way from the nearest significant patch of planting. Soon after that, we had uh, more birds. So these were wagtails. The number of insects was increasing. Then we had a problematic species to deal with, rats, uh, which was a bit of a pain and their numbers were expanding rather rapidly, but never mind, we were still getting more birds and insects. Then we had mice to deal with as well, but still more birds and insects, which was good. And then three days after the algae ponds were filled, we had the first dragonflies appearing. And again, this was quite remarkable because we were, long, we were a long way from the nearest dragonfly habitat. Nature seems to have an amazing capacity to regenerate if you can just create the right conditions. The next thing was that we had an appearance from a feral cat, which was quite handy because the number of rats and mice started going down. We were still getting more birds and insects. Then we had an appearance from quite a rare bird. It's called a hoopoe, not often seen in this part of Qatar. Then as other uh, plant species were established, we had different types of birds. This was a, a rufous-tailed shrike other types of wagtails. And eventually we had the first indigenous mammal. It's called a jaboa. It's like a, a little hopping kangaroo that leaves very distinctive tracks. All of that was achieved in just eight months on a site 100 meters by 100 meters. And I'm absolutely convinced that if we were to do that on a larger scale over a longer time scale, that regenerative effect would be even more pronounced. Now moving on to regenerative cities, one of the most, most persuasive models I've heard for how to create a regenerative city comes from a group of consultants in the US, they're called Biomimicry 3.8, established by Janine Benius and Dana Baumeister. And what they argue is that the way we go about designing buildings and cities currently doesn't go anywhere near far enough. And what we should do as urban designers, architects, engineers, at the start of a project is we should study how a mature, pristine ecosystem in that part of the world would function. How much oxygen would it produce? How much carbon would it sequester? How much wildlife would it accommodate? How much food would it produce? And those should all become the metrics, the targets for our new piece of city. We're nowhere near that at the moment, but I'm absolutely convinced that is possible. And when we get to that point, then we could reasonably argue that we have integrated that new piece of city into a broader, stable ecosystem. The interesting thing is that there are already buildings that show elements of this. So for instance, we're seeing more and more buildings that are incorporating vegetation. I wouldn't necessarily advocate having uh, trees on tall buildings, but I do think there's a, a really good case for incorporating vegetation, partly to create more habitats for animals, partly for its um, uh, uh, psychological benefits uh, in terms of people's well-being, and also for microclimatic cooling. We will need to find a way to do this without using more concrete. We'll need to find a way to do this, ideally with uh, timber-framed construction. One of the biggest changes I think we would see in a regenerative city is in the spaces between buildings. And I love this example in Seoul, South Korea. This used to be covered by a six lane elevated motorway. And the mayor of, of Seoul managed to persuade people to tear this down and restore the river underneath and turn it into this amazing linear park, which has become the most fantastic uh, amenity for people, allowing them to, to walk uh, a long distance. It's even had a really profound effect on the temperatures in this part of the city, reducing summer temperatures by a significant amount. Another key aspect of a regenerative city, I believe, is in looking at cities with ecosystem models in mind. So what I mean by that is considering each element of a city in terms of its resource flows and trying to get closer to the way that ecosystems model, so uh, function. So in a, a mature ecosystem, the output from one from one element of that system, the output from one part of it becomes the input for something else. So it moves towards being a highly productive zero waste system. And 
we have the knowledge to do this already. Uh, it's been tested. Well, there's a very good example near you uh, in Kalundborg. That was an industrial estate that's been planned on these lines. And I understand this is also being pursued in Hammerby Sjöstad, the extension to Stockholm. And we really ought to be doing this on, on all our cities because this would be truly transformative, transforming uh, wasteful systems into zero waste systems that also create uh, better job opportunities. We explored some of these ideas on the Sahara Forest Project. So what we have here is, <coughs> excuse me, the, the green icons, those represent the different technologies. And in simple terms, what we were doing is using what we had a lot of sunlight, seawater and carbon dioxide to produce more of what we need, biomass, oxygen, electricity, crops and materials. So we looked at all the different inputs and outputs and connected those up so that we were uh, transforming any uh, waste stream into something that cre created more value. Sometimes when I show this kind of diagram to people, they think, well, that looks unbelievably complicated. How, how could we possibly design for something like this? Well, I would argue that this is nowhere near as complicated as a real ecosystem. And actually, with digital tools, it's going to become easier and easier to design for this level of complexity. And one of my colleagues that I work with actually created a little design tool to make it easier to design these kind of systems. So what this allows you to do is to input different technologies, to connect them up. It shows you anything that is underutilized, and that's a, an indication that you can actually add something to the system to create more value. Then you can also uh, press play and it shows you how the system is functioning. You can test it for resilience. It, so if you take one of those links and you cut it, and that if the whole system breaks down, then that's an indication that you need to add further buffering, redundancy or duplication to make it more robust. And with this kind of complexity, we can get closer and closer to zero waste systems that run entirely on solar energy and are highly productive as well as being regenerative to the places in which they are situated. Now moving on to regenerative buildings. This one I'm going to show you is a, a project for an office building. And uh, this was a, a new opportunity for us. People had often said to us, you know, well, biomimicry is very interesting, but you know, how would you apply it to a, a, a normal building? I had previously worked on a, a massive greenhouse project called the Eden Project. And we use biomimicry on that, but admittedly, that's quite an unusual building. So here we were working on a, a very regular building type. And our client wanted us to really explore the potential for biomimicry to create breakthroughs. The client actually gave us a lot of uh, leeway. Uh, he allowed me to choose exactly the right team. So I brought together some of the best consultants that I've got to know over the last couple of decades. And particularly, I chose people who were polymaths, people who understand a lot more than just their own discipline and who are really curious about everything else. And I find that uh, the design process is at its most enjoyable when you have a group of polymaths around the table and the divisions or the new normal boundaries bit between disciplines break down. And you might find the landscape architect comes up with an engineering idea and the engineer comes up with a, an idea for, um, I don't know, the, how the entrance could be much more successful. And this is quite a different model to the way that so-called iconic architects often work. There, there, there's a, a tendency still for iconic architects to do a sexy sketch on the back of an envelope and then expect the rest of the team to just make that happen. And I think that's just way out of date. You know, if you've got a brilliant team, then you need a, a process that can actually draw the best out from that team. And I think the uh, the model for an architect that we should look to more is the, the idea of a conductor. So there's a brilliant TED talk by someone called Benjamin Zander. And he talks about how a conductor doesn't make a sound, but dis uh, depends instead for their power on making other people powerful, trying to draw the best out from the orchestra and unify that into a cohesive result. And that's what I aspire to do as an architect, trying to draw the best ideas out from the team and then find a way to integrate those into a, a cohesive whole. In the first workshop, we decided that daylight was likely to be one of the biggest drivers of the architectural form. 
and we had a biologist as part of the team and he helped us to find examples of how light is gathered and distributed in biology. So, so this is the essence of biomimicry, looking at how functions have been delivered in nature. So the first one we looked at is called a spookfish. And the spookfish has these amazing mirror-shaped eyes, which focus low levels of light coming up from the ocean and focuses that onto its retina. Another one we looked at is a, a plant that lives in deserts. So this is called a stone plant. And for reasons of thermal stabilization, most of the plant lives below the ground. That means that the uh, chemical reactions, the photosynthesis can take place at a steady temperature. And it has what you could call a roof light, which allows the light to come down to the basement. The third one we looked at is an organism called a brittle star. So this is a type of starfish that lives in quite deep ocean water where there's very low light levels. It has evolved a covering of near optically perfect lenses on its skin. So this organism is able to detect very small amounts of light and movement and focus that onto receptors so it can see predators before they see it. These three examples, and actually many others within biology, encourage us to think much more creatively and deliberately about how we would bring light into the building. A conventional way of designing for light in offices is to just look at the right distance between the window walls. Now, it's quite common in places like London to find really deep offices that may be 25, 30 meters deep, and you know those are gonna be energy intensive buildings because they'll be largely artificially lit and ventilated. So what's the right dimension? Well, we reckon it was about 12 meters, so no one is further than six meters from the nearest window. What does this suggest for the form? Well, one approach would be to take these narrow floors and stack them up into a, a, a tower. And that would be fine if we were dealing with high land values in a dense urban location. We wanted to create a more universal model than that. So we looked at other two other forms. One was a, a ring of office space around an atrium. And then the other one was a, a more linear approach with these linear blocks and a linear atrium down the middle. And it was the last one that seemed to work best when we analyzed the light levels. So, excuse me, just a second. So looking at the light levels in plan uh, using daylight software, what we found was that we were getting this curved pattern of shading because of the shading effect of the opposite block. So the next design move was to simply bend those floor plates so that we could get a very even quality of light all the way along. Now this produced a couple of further challenges. The first is that narrow floor plates aren't great for creative clusters of people. You need some wider floors. And this was also not making very, use, very good use of a rectangular site. And we were probably going to end up with a rectangular site. So then learning further ideas from biology about surface area to volume optimization we elaborated the plan form into this undulating shape. So we still had no point further than six meters from the nearest window, but now we were getting much better facilities for creative clusters of people, um, and we were making more efficient use of a rectangular site. Still with daylight, but now looking at the building in section, uh, we found that it was reasonably easy to get enough light into the upper parts of the building. The challenge was how we'd get that light further down we looked at the possibility of harvesting light near the top and focusing that into fiber optic tubes. And for this, we looked at a rainforest plant called Anthurium waraquinum, which has done something very similar. It has lenses on its leaves and somehow those are able to focus diffuse light. So this has become a research project, which we hope to feed in to the next stage of the office project. We concluded that there was a good case for shaping the building to bring more light in. And then we proposed in the atrium a pair of mirrors inspired by the spookfish that would bounce light into those lower floors. And then thinking about what we do underneath that pair of mirrors, we thought this was a great opportunity to uh, design a, a really dramatic meeting space that would add value to the building and could be let out for functions. So that was all about light. When it came to the structure, the way we used biomimicry was to try and uh, refine the amount of material as much as possible. 
So this image here, this is a section through a bird skull, which we modeled in 3D um, and uh, created this 3D printed model. And in this sketch, um, I, I, what I'm drawing here is that, um, oops, that, that's one that's got out of sequence, sorry. All right, well, not to worry, I'll, I'll just explain the, um, the, the structural optimization ideas. In biology, you can get, find a lot of examples of very efficient structures that achieve their efficiency through really quite a complicated shape. So biology has evolved to put the material exactly where it needs to be to create the most efficient form. And that bird skull example was a good example of that because you have these incredibly thin layers of bone connected together with struts and ties. And we explored this and showed how we could do something similar using 3D printed technology, 3D uh, manufacturing, getting uh, pretty close to the ideal that we had identified in biology. And that's why I think biomimicry is a really powerful tool to use as a design team, because you can allow the design conversation to wander off in pursuit of the most idealized solutions. And then you can come back to that, come back from that to something that is achievable within our current constraints of te technology, time, and cost. But unless you go through that first stage of identifying the ideal, you're very unlikely to make a breakthrough. If I had more time, I'd love to tell you all the other things we learned from biology on this project. We looked at nearly 100 different biological organisms going through this design process. So for instance, we learned from curved shells and curved leaf forms to design a new glazing system which used incredibly thin pieces of glass fixed back to back so that they could span floor to floor without mullions. And that would achieve a roughly 50% saving in glass and a 75% saving in aluminium. We also studied examples of folding forms in plant petals and in folding beetle wings. And that helped us design a sun shading system that would let in exactly the right amount of light and convert all surplus light to electricity. This is how the scheme looked after we completed the feasibility study, showing that we could do this for a realistic cost. And you can see here a lot of the ideas I've been talking about, the form driven by daylight. You might just be able to make out the curved elements of glass. And in the middle, you can see the Spookfish Auditorium. And this is how it would look in, the, in that atrium space. One of the engineers involved has predicted that if this gets built, it should be one of the lowest energy office buildings in the world. And by using ideas of, of daylight and extensive planting in the office spaces, we should also be able to achieve a really substantial improvement in people's productivity. And you only have to achieve a fairly modest increase in people's productivity, and you find that the building can pay for itself completely in as little as five years. So a further example of a regenerative building that I want to talk to you about is this one. It's the Zero Waste Textiles Factory, which we developed for a client in India. And he had a, a real vision for new industrial buildings in India. He wanted this to be zero carbon, as close as possible to zero waste, and as close as possible to closed loop on water. And uh, we really explored some of the key differences between human-made systems and biological systems here. So on the right-hand side, these are some of the key characteristics of biological systems. And you can see there's really quite a profound contrast between the way we conventionally do things as humans and the way that we do, the way things happen in biology. So that right-hand list, I think that's a very good summary of where we need to be heading with our cities and industries. And all of those are, are characteristics from biology. In the factory, the way we went about this was that we conceived of the project as having three main realms. There was the factory itself with all its processes and machinery. There was the water cycle, and then there was the energy cycle. So within the factory, we looked at all the, the different resource flows for those processes and identified where we could achieve savings and synergies. The big breakthrough came from shifting from fossil fuels to, to biomass, which meant that we were producing heat and electricity. And we were making use of all the waste heat. We were also making use of 
uh, the uh, canteen waste to produce small amounts of gas and compost, which could go back to the uh, cotton production. With the water cycle, the, the big breakthrough there was in working with our chemists and biologists and water expert to design out all the toxins from the processes. And by designing out toxins, we were then able to use biological forms of treatments using plants and microorganisms to treat all that water. The inside looked roughly like this. So we were using roof lights to create a really good quality of light in the building. And then with large picture windows down the edges, we were giving all the people in the factory a view out towards nature. And just coming back to that overview there, uh, you can see the, the buildings um, with the uh, north facing roof lights so letting in daylight, but not sunlight down the middle. That's actually the, the water treatment system, the, the plants and microorganisms that are treating the, the water from the factory. And in the middle is the staff canteen. So at least three times a day, the people in the factory can come out and get a good break uh, with a, a view out to nature. And we showed that we could get all the way to zero carbon, very close to, to zero solid waste and, and closed loop on water with a payback period of roughly five or six years. Frustratingly, that project didn't go ahead because it was decided that that payback period was too long. And um, we found that, um, well, as I say, quite frustrating, really. And we worked with the clients uh, because we sensed that the the view that was being taken on economics was perhaps a bit limited because that payback period was just based on the, the value of the energy and resource savings. And we said to our client, well, you know, just supposing this was built and on the first day you brought around one of your best clients, say the international buyer for H&M, and on the basis of what they saw, if they gave you a, a, a reasonable sized contract, what would that be worth? And they said, well, the, the profit from that would pay for the building uh, completely. And so we said, well, why aren't you prepared to, to go for it? And they said, well, we're just not convinced that that is uh, realistic. So we're still working with the clients and we're introducing them to people from some of the big retailers. And we still hope that this project will go ahead because if it did, I think it actually, it would give our clients long-term resilience, uh, particularly in terms of tightening legislation. It's very likely that legislation on what kind of water and what kind of toxins can be discharged, that's gonna get ever tighter. And with a scheme like this, it would be resilient against increases in uh, legislation. And it's actually very cheap to run. Once the payback period is passed, the, the energy and water costs are far lower than a conventional scheme. And th that project and the office building actually points to one other element that's, I think, really important in regenerative design, which is biophilia. So biophilia refers to the, the way that because humans evolved in direct contact with nature, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that we are happier, healthier and more productive if we're in regular contact with nature. The best bit of evidence I've seen for this it comes from a hospital that had one particular ward in which everyone was recovering from the same operation. So it was a good controlled experiment. Half the beds had a view out to a planted courtyard and the other half had a view to a, a blank brick wall on the other side of the road. And what they found was that people with the view of nature recovered 8% more quickly and needed half the amount of pain relieving drugs compared to the people with the view of the brick wall. And imagine, quite apart from the amazing human benefits of treating everyone 8% more quickly, imagine the economic benefits if all hospitals were, were designed that way. So that we treated everyone 8% more quickly with half the amount of drugs. So the final category I want to talk about is regenerative materials. And uh, this is a bit of a, a hero um, of the biomimicry world, really. This is called a coccolithophore. So this is a, a marine microorganism that forms these amazingly beautiful uh, skeletons out of calcium carbonate. And um, it's argued in the Gaia hypothesis that was developed by biologists James Love Lovelock and Lynn Margulis. It's argued that this used to be part of the regulatory cycle for uh, carbon on, on planet Earth. 
and when the levels of CO2 rose in the atmosphere, you would have had massive blooms of these microorganisms in the sea. They have a short lifespan. Those, would have, those skeletons would have fallen to the ocean floor and built up layers of limestone, transferring carbon from the atmosphere into the rock, and thereby reestablishing the balance. The conclusion you could draw from that as a biomimic is that one solution to climate change would be to just make a lot more stuff out of atmospheric carbon. And of course, this is what uh, biology does in, in lots of different examples. So the closest thing that we have to, to concrete would be coral reefs. These are large scale mineral structures. But the difference in way they, those two are made is pretty profound. Concrete produces huge quantities of CO2. Uh, I, I believe something like 8% of the global greenhouse gases are from cement production, whereas coral grows by taking carbon out of its immediate environment and turning that into solid form. And this really ought to be an area for really focused scientific study, finding out how we can mimic biomineralization and geomineralization so that when we use concrete, a new form of concrete that would be, it would be actually doing good. It would be taking carbon out of the atmosphere, not uh, emitting carbon to it. And uh, there are already some, some really interesting products around. This is one called Biomason. So this is a way of making blocks using calcifying bacteria. So you can put sand into a mold, you add bacteria and a little bit of nutrient solution. And in just three to five days, it becomes a solid block with none of the heat input or cement input that you need co for conventional brick and block manufacturing. There are growing numbers of companies now that are making building products out of uh, biological materials. This is a, um, a mycelium insulation manufactured by a, a company called Biome in London. And you can use a wide range of uh, agricultural waste, plant fibers to produce a really uh, high performance, completely non-toxic uh, material uh, for insulation in buildings. And this is a table that my office designed for an exhibition. So this was inspired by tree and bone growth patterns, and it was 3D printed using biologically derived uh, polymer material. So it's using inspiration from biology in a number of ways, uh, trying to get as close as possible to a theoretically perfect structural form, putting the material exactly where it needs to be, and then using carbon derived from the atmosphere to, to build that. And that, I believe, is what we need to do a lot of. So to conclude now, I just want to say a few things about um, you know, how we bring about these kind of shifts, uh, because you know, having the solutions is, is just one thing. But how do we actually shift the whole course of the industry and actually the, the course of our economies and, and society more generally? And that was part of the thinking behind Architects Declare, uh, which I jointly initiated, which expanded to construction declares. And then we made it as easy as possible for other people in other parts of the world to set up their own groups. So there are now groups in Denmark, as well as Norway, Sweden. And in fact, we have Architects Declare, or, or Built Environment Declares, as it's now called, as it's kind of uh, umbrella organization that exists in 28 different countries and we have over 7,000 companies signed up to a declaration of action. So um, some people I, I, I meet wonder why these kind of changes haven't come in already and some people point to the financial crisis in 2007 and wonder why that wasn't a, a moment of a big reset, a rethink about the way that our economies are, are driven. And some people have argued that that didn't happen because we didn't have the solutions clearly articulated and we didn't have the skills to deliver them. I actually disagree with that analysis. I think we've had the skills and solutions for quite a long time, but there is one thing that is still fundamentally missing. And that is that I still see a lot of complacency, particularly amongst politicians, and also to some extent amongst the, the mass media who, who seem very reluctant to show leadership on climate change. And um, in the UK, our politicians really, I, I sometimes really doubt 
that they rule in the long-term interests of the British people. Uh, they, they seem to be taking more and more decisions in the short-term interests of their funders. They would do anything to, to hang on to power. And there's not a single prime minister in Britain in the last 25 years that has had the courage to tell people how serious climate change is. So I think we to, to overcome this, we need to make it more and more uncomfortable for the, the private individuals and companies that are funding and thereby corrupting our democracies and delaying action on climate change. And we need to do something similar to this, not necessarily Extinction Rebellion. Fridays the for the Future, I think, uh, may, may well become a much more influential movement. But one way or another, we need to show that we are adding public demand, sufficient public demand. So together with the solutions, the skills and public demand, we could overcome the resistance to these solutions because we, we live in truly bizarre times. You know, we have all the solutions to make rapid progress on climate change and we've had them for a, a long time. And we really urgently need to bring about a tipping point so that all those solutions can, can flourish. And to conclude, I want to say a few more words about this amazing organism. So this is called a, a glass sponge. These have evolved to create these phenomenally beautiful and incredibly lightweight structures just out of available materials of, of silica and calcium carbonate in seawater. And it's, um, it's something that engineers have been studying for a long time, as well as material scientists, looking at just how this organism has evolved to do what it does. The images on the right hand side, those show the vertical fibers. So each of those is a glass fiber with higher optical quality than human made glass fiber. Above the seabed, it, it has smooth sides. Then when it gets below the seabed, it has those little kind of barbs. And each of those terminates in a cluster of lenses. Those lenses are able to gather light from bioluminescent bacteria in the seabed and conduct it up the, the, um, the, the tube, the, the fiber optic tube, uh, so that it can put on a lighting display on the structure and, and draw food to the organism. It also cultivates another sim symbiotic relationship there, there's a species of prawn that lays its eggs in, in the uh, glass sponge and pairs of prawns grow up together trapped within that. And I think this, this really highlights what an amazing source of solutions biology is. You know, you could look at the, the, the living world as being like an, the most amazing design book, uh, source book that has all benefited from 3.8 billion years of, of research and development. 3.8 billion years of brilliant solutions illuminated by previously unparalleled scientific knowledge and facilitated by previously unimaginable design tools. And in this particular example, it shows us how we could make beautiful lightweight structures. It shows how we could make glass with perhaps a one millionth of the energy input of conventional uh, human made glass manufacturing. And it shows how we could cultivate symbiotic relationships. And it also really importantly points to a new relationship with biology. You know, for far too long, we have had a dualistic perspective on nature. We have seen nature as something separate to us and nature as something that can be plundered for resources. This points to a completely new sensibility of seeing nature not just as a source of wonder, but also as a source of some of the best solutions that can help us design solutions fit for the future. And to really bring about a shift from the sustainability age that was too much about just being less bad, about mitigating negatives into a new realm of optimizing positives and overcoming our dualism so that we get to the point of, of co-evolving as nature. That is the urgent task for humanity, to get to the point where we have integrated everything we do into the web of life. Thank you very much. Delighted to take questions now. And uh, the, there are two books I've written. If you're interested in finding out more about some of these ideas, one is called Biomimicry and Architecture. And then the more recent one, which I co-authored with Sarah Ichioka, is called Flourish, Design Paradigms for Our Planetary Emergency.
really a tour de force. And I have thank you. Thank uh, you. I have so many questions, but uh, I also want to invite people here to to raise your hand if you have a question or anything. I think just to let you know, there were so many people nodding when you uh, emphasized on the myopic perspectives from politicians and also the 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 need for for action of of some sort. And one of the things that you and I have actually talked about in our conversations before today uh, was about the tipping point. The fact that there is, we have still, we, we see these uh, small patterns of movement, but, but far from a tipping point. And where you were talking about, so how do we accelerate the tipping point, which you alluded to here at the end, and you had people nodding as well. But just before the science talk earlier today, I met uh, one of the companies in Denmark that are focusing on developing bio-based materials uh, in, from circular principles to make sure that also the materials that already exist can be reused, etc. And I asked him if things were going well, just out of curiosity. And he said, it's going very well. There are huge demand from our materials. He says, that's not the problem. And I said, so what is the problem? And he said, now the problem is that people won't accept or understand that these types of materials do not perform in exactly the same way as the artificially constructed and produced materials. So just, and I was thinking of just how perfect it was that you were here with us today to perhaps help us address how do we accelerate that understanding. So that was some of my just, but I'll let, just want, I'm eager to see any questions or comments because we have some wonderful people with us. And we do, thank you, thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Michael, thanks so much. Um, Flourish was my summer reading, so thank you for keeping me occupied uh, in the heat that we've been experiencing. So I'm part of a new philanthropic uh, startup uh, foundation that's dedicated to achieving architectures of planetary well-being. So we're just starting up and trying to figure out how do we even tackle this space? How do we move money to the right places? Um, so I wanted to ask you, how do you think philanthropy can play a role in this area and help accelerate it? Um, where does the money need to move to, uh, to to make this agenda actually get built and uh, get integrated into our systems? Excellent. Mm. Yeah, so, um, well, I mean, it's, it's certainly helpful to, <laughs> to have a philanthropist. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, we, we have seen a, a, an impressive shift in, in philanthropy. And, um, you know, without wanting to be disrespectful or kind of <laughs> ungrateful to the philanthropists that exist, there, there is quite a good uh, quote from, Martin Luther King. I can't remember exactly what he said, but you know we need to be wary of um, accepting the situation that that makes philanthropy necessary. And some of these challenges that we're addressing are, are so big that we really do need a political solution. And, and I worry that just having a few philanthropists is not going to be fast enough. However, um, it's certainly useful uh, to have philanthropic money to get things off the ground. So I don't, I don't have any um, problem with, with accepting philanthropic money, and uh, you know, I, I salute those philanthropists who, who are willing to support this. And um, you know, I think um, that there, there has been quite a fundamental shift because people are realizing that the the, the current situation is going to change a lot of things you know is, is going to change what we mean by success i mean who would want to be hugely successful at being degenerative it's also going to change our idea of purpose you know it, what, what kind of purpose is going to feel worthwhile if it's completely at odds with rescuing the the, the you know the pathway that we're on uh, so I, I don't know if those are quite answering your question. Uh, feel free to ask a sort of follow-up part to that if, if, if that's not quite getting to the essence of what you wanted. I heard that philanthropy is a very complicated space and actually built on quite capitalist uh, yeah, infrastructures. So also rethinking philanthropy from the ground up is also part of what we're trying to do. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, a lot of conversations to, to be had I, on I that. Would, 
recommend, recommend a, a book, book. Um, that's uh, called Winner Takes All by Anand Giridharadas. And, and the subtitle is something like um, The Elite Charade About Saving the World. And uh, it, it was written by someone who worked a lot with philanthropic money and attended lots of Davos meetings and became more and more disillusioned with the idea that this this is going to save everything. Okay, and we have two more questions, at least three, three more. So yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for a, a really interesting and inspiring talk. I think in these times of, of uncertainty, showing a way forward is, is really, really important. So thank you for for bringing hope into the conversation as well. Uh, my question goes to your inspiration. I mean, nature is a, a big place. <laughs> there, uh, how do you find these organisms, these mm. dynamics that you're looking for? Do you have biologists on your team or, or where does that come from? Yes, so it used to be a little bit random. So I, I have always read quite a lot of science magazines. And so for quite a while, it was just a matter of kind of what crossed my radar. But the, the good news is that for the last 10 years or more now, there, there's actually been very good online resources. So there's one that's called asknature.org. And that allows you to enter some kind of functional challenge and it uh, as a search function. And then it shows a number of biological organisms that, that have solved that. And then I've also built up quite a good network with biologists. So there are some uh, particularly good ones that I like working with who understand the design process and seem to have really quite a, a, an encyclopedic knowledge. And there's a, a nice quote from Janine Benius. So she's one of the pioneers of biomimicry. She wrote the first book that really popularized it called Biomimicry Design Inspired by Nature. And um, she talks about how the, the typical involvement the, the typical involvement of a biologist in a construction project is that they're brought on to do the body count once the design's been completed. And actually, there's a, a, a much more fruitful collaboration to be had by bringing them really early, bringing them into the process really early on and looking at fun, some of the fundamental strategic challenges. Um, and you know, I'm talking about quite big picture stuff about you know how how we integrate everything we do in, into the web of life. And, and when you approach a new project, looking at that, that place and asking yourself a really important question, which is what solutions already exist in this place? And that means both biological adaptations as well as some, some of the adaptations that have evolved through thousands of years of human ingenuity. Michael, <clears throat> hello. Thank you for that beautifully dense talk. I really love it. Um, just a just a sort of question, or maybe a provocation. It's it's one of those things uh, where it's almost prosaic to say that the future is based on the present, right? Uh, you don't have the situation in the year two thousand where people are, you know, flying around on car, uh, you know, vehicles in the sky like the Jetsons predicted. So. On that basis, the city itself is a kind of ecological organism that is dysfunctioning, but it has a range of infrastructures that are baked into the fabric of the city. We talk about sewage, uh, the way we produce energy, the way we consume uh, food products, plastics, etc. We know that we need to re-engineer uh, the uh, biological or interrelationship between the city and the country, but on an infrastructural level, where can you see the biggest opportunities? Yeah, so I, I mentioned this partly in the talk. I, I do think that that rethinking cities using ecosystem models is, is a really important one. I also think that a, a more rational and um, enlightened attitude towards transport is a really important one. And um, you know, Copenhagen has already done a lot on this with the work of Jan Gale and so on, but um, other cities have got a lot of catching up to do. Um, so I imagine you're, you're probably pretty familiar with how much less space is taken up by you know, 100 people in buses compared to 100 people in cars and so on. And it, you know, if we were to do that uh, more generally in cities, it would actually release a lot of urban space for what is sometimes called green and blue infrastructure. Um, I'd, I prefer to call it um, living systems because I find the, the term infrastructure a little bit cold when, you, when you're talking about uh, uh, 
planting and, and bodies of water and, and so on. I think this also touches on um, a, a potential misstep that could be taken at the moment. So there's an academic in, in the UK called Julian Allwood, who's argued that, that we finished with phony war number one, which was the, the war about is climate change real and serious and all that sort of nonsense. We're now into phony war number two, which is trying to argue that technology has all the answers. And I, I can see this already playing out at the moment in the UK, where the easiest thing to do would be for politicians to argue that, well, all we need to do is shift fossil fuel based cars to electric cars. And, and that would be a, a massively missed opportunity in cities because that will do nothing to address problems of congestion, social isolation, uh, uh, obesity, or, or the dominant dominance of cars in urban spaces. And a, a much more transformative model would be something like the 15 minute city, which is being um, uh, um, implemented in Paris. And the idea there is that you can retrofit cities so that people can access everything they need on a daily or weekly basis within a 15 minute walk or cycle. And, and you can achieve a really dramatic reduction in the need for, for private cars. People are actually healthier and, and happier and have have much better social connections. Um, and then a, a further one that I put in, which is uh, one that we talk about in the book, Sarah and I, is a really interesting idea from the environmentalist George Monbiot, where he talks about how what we currently have is a, a lot of private wealth and public squalor. And what we should do is move towards private sufficiency and public luxury. And what that means is shifting towards much more use of, of, of shared resources. So you know, if, if each of us tried to have our own swimming pool and tennis court and gym and, and private car and associated roads, there simply wouldn't be enough space. And yet we could create almost as good a quality of life for everyone with an absolute fraction of the space and, and resources. And, and that's the kind of city that we really could create a, a much better quality of life for everyone with a fraction of the energy and a fraction of the resources. Thank you. We have one question from here in Copenhagen, and then we also have a digital question. And since my wonderful colleague, Freya, is by our uh, screen, can you read out the question? And then we finish with a live question here from Copenhagen afterwards. Yes, I can. It's from Peter from Habitus, and he's asking, on biodiversity, how was rats and mice problematic species in Qatar in the Qatar project? Isn't there an argument to be made that new ecosystems need time to go from a competitive state to a state of synergy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. I mean, they were only problematic because there were rather a lot of them and um, they were kind of eating into the, the sacks of seeds and, and, and so on. They're, they're not problematic in the sense that they're right to exist. Um, but also some of them were, were, were not, um, well, they weren't um, indigenous um, species um, and those tend to be disruptive to, to ecosystems. But the, the point that the, 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 your questioner is making is, is absolutely valid. And, and yes, um, ecosystems do go through quite, um, uh, dynamic moments uh, uh, and so it's not all steady and, and balanced necessarily but what we got to was we were moving towards a much more balanced system and that you know there were still rats and mice as part of that we didn't try and completely eliminate them and our last question <laughs> hello and thank you so much for all the wonderful brain food that was fascinating um, and I just have a quick practical question the software that you showed us where you have the the web and the inputs and how you change the different uh what what soft could I ask what software that is well it's a, a tool we created to, uh, for ourselves at the moment we need to do some further development work on it i'm not exactly sure what the tools were that we used to create it but i th i think it may have been grasshopper with various plugins but um I, I'm I'm a bit of a digital dinosaur myself. I know how to brief a, a computational designer and, and, and tell him or her what, what, what I want, but um, I don't do that work myself. Thank you. 
a begging, uh, begging hand for one final, final question. And we see it as such a keen interest, so we're going to do it. Thank you, Michael. Just one last like question. Hello, Michael. Uh, I'm Thank you. My name is Justine. I'm a British Danish architect. I've also read your book and think it should be on all reading lists, yeah. especially for architectural students. I have a question regarding um, biomimicry's relation to the high tech and uh, potentially, um, if we could dis discuss on the other side, low tech or vernacular, vernacular uh, historic and pre industrial building technologies and uh, their relation to uh, localism, material localism, and uh, decarbonized materials. Um, if you could give any input to that, uh, specifically relating to how architecture, I think, can be most important now in communicating a systems change. So how can we communicate these ideas of our connectedness to nature, of our need to build differently, and uh, my argumentation is perhaps that it needs to be a little bit less high-tech so that it can be a little bit more accessible. Thank you. Mm. Okay, yeah, well, thank you for that. There are lots, lots of interesting elements to that question. Um, so uh, high-tech, well, I, I used to work for a, a high-tech architect, Grimshaw, and, um, it, you know, there's some of it that I admire, uh, that, that there is a kind of inventiveness and ingenuity to some of it. Sometimes there is a kind of overcomplicated element to it that is not necessarily efficient and um, not particularly connected with the, the specifics of the place. Um, so I, I am increasingly interested in low-tech solutions. And you know, I think Julia Watson's book, which is called Low Tech, is, is absolutely brilliant. And I spend quite a bit of time looking at a website called Low Tech, or Low Tech Magazine. And um, Sarah and I say in the book that you know, one of the most exciting things about the age that we're entering is that we're going to see an amazing reawakening of the kind of ingenuity that existed prior to the fossil fuel age. So I think fossil fuels, because they've been it's been so easy to burn fossil fuels to meet all our needs, it's been a kind of distraction from that ingenuity. And now we, we, we need to reawaken a lot of those very low tech solutions. And you know, I, I'm particularly thinking of ways that existed to create ice in the desert um, thousands of years ago, the Persians found a way to do that. And you know, when you compare that with the kind of absurdities that are uh, committed by so-called um, advanced architects in, in Middle Eastern countries with fully glazed um, buildings in uh, a desert environment, you, know, you start to question the whole idea of progress. And I, I think it's far more interesting, far more relevant to do what I think you're alluding to, which is to look at the low-tech solutions that existed prior to the fossil fuel age that were almost certainly much more related to the place. And if we reawaken those and, and reinterpret them, it, it really doesn't have to be a kind of nostalgia trip at all. We can we can still use our current modern ingenuity to, to um, reimagine those. Um, and and to create an architecture that is 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 far more relevant and far more embedded in the place than, than typically high tech was. I think that was uh, the final words, finishing with a, uh, a positive in terms of the possibilities that uh, lie ahead us, while also calling to action and engagement and commitment. Um, Mike, I think we could actually continue for 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 a very long time because you have uh, just uh, shared uh, with us your thoughts and also your experiences. So we'll we'll most likely reach out to you again uh, to continue the conversation. Uh, but for now, just a huge thank you. It was a, a true pleasure and honor to have you with us today at our science talks. Thank you for you, for, sh for being with us uh, virtually, physically. We will continue. It doesn't, it, this, is, uh, this is an ongoing journey and it's also an ongoing uh, commitment to, to, to transform.
and you've well, provided well, you, us Camilla. with insight. And, and, and thank you, thank you to the audience for, for your questions. It's been a real pleasure to be involved. We've really, really enjoyed it. So I think we'll finish with a huge round of applause to every yes. You've helped us understand the regenerative much more. We will continue. So for those of you who are thinking, OK, this is we we're together in this, right? We need to to get the communication, the arguments, the examples. Stay tuned. Uh, visit us on our website because we have uh, we're also going to do debates. We want to regenerate now. So help us participate, commit. And Michael, I wish you a wonderful day. I know you and I were both quite despondent about the heat wave. We were not happy. Uh, but that doesn't mean we give up. Thank you, and I Absolutely. wish you a very, very good day. Take care. Thank you very much. Okay. And thank you, everyone. Bye now.